Welcome to another session of Virtual Symposium 2020. My name is Jim Kaler and I am your host today, along with several of these virtual sessions we've been doing, and very excited to be introducing you to a young man that's gonna play really a pivotal role as, as we get going on uh, sports gambling. But before I bring Matt into the discussion, uh, and I've been doing this with each of these. I, I, I once again want to thank our MSA class of 2020. Um, this is a class that would have been producing a live event on campus, but they weren't going to let COVID-19 stop them. And they are working awful hard behind the scenes to help us put really some history together in Ohio's family with our first ever virtual symposium. So kudos to that class. And by the way, uh, I'm working with all of them right now on placements with full-time jobs. So if you have any openings, please get a hold of me. All right, so it's my pleasure right now to officially welcome uh, Matt Holt to the camera. And Matt, uh, so good to have you here live from Las Vegas. And if we're going to be talking about sports gambling, what a better place to be conducting this interview. I wish I was out there with you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. We actually finally got some great weather. Uh, 92 degrees, Las Vegas today. Wow, wow. Well, Matt, um, just to give everybody a backdrop on this, you and I first met when our students were out at the National Sports Forum in Las Vegas a year and a half ago, and they had the chance to hear you as part of their residency. And Greg Sullivan, who was running the program at the time, said, boy, you got to get a hold of Matt because we should be doing something with him. And little did we both know that after a conversation or two, we we're like, hey, why don't we take uh, everything you know about sports gambling and create a online executive course on sports gambling education, sports gambling awareness. And lo and behold, we're, we're about ready to launch. So, uh, and, and, and they got a kick out of, listening to you speak in Vegas, and you actually were able to take them behind the scenes at one of the, uh, I think it was South Point Casino, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so re real quick, before um, we get going into the content, in, in the country, there are a few people that have dedicated as much of their career to the whole uh, arena stadium of sports gambling, and uh, when we learned about your background, like, man, this guy, you know, if, if uh, we were ever to do a conference on sports gambling, he'd be the keynote. So walk our, our alums and everybody through your background and how you got to where you did today with as, you know, founder and president of U.S. Integrity. Sure. So at a high school, I went into the Air Force. Uh, I wanted to be an air traffic controller. Um, once I was in the Air Force and doing it, I realized I didn't want to be an air traffic controller. So I... Uh, once I got out of the out of the service, I went to the University of Kentucky, transferred over to Moorhead State University, where I got my degree in uh, sports management. And I came out here actually with the intent to work for the UFC. One of my friends was working there at the time, and uh, by the time I got out here to UFC, uh, following the day after I graduated college, my friend had left UFC to go join Pride, uh, that organiz the other MMA organization at the time, and. Uh, the next day, I, I called someone I knew and got a job at a company called Don Best, and I've literally spent my entire post-collegiate career working in sports betting, and I was able to work at, uh, that, at Don Best for seven years. It's an odds aggregation company. Um, they, do, they basically pull in odds from around the world, track injuries, information. They create something called the... Um, the international rotation number, which is that number when you go to, to a sports books to bet, you know, if you don't say, give me the Patriots, you say, give me 701. And they're the ones that create that number that you use when you actually go to a casino. And from there, from Don Best, I went and joined uh, a company called Cantor Gaming, which was the largest licensed sports book operator in the country at the time. They were backed by the financial firm Cantor Fitzgerald. And I was the uh, VP of business development there and the chief operating officer of their sister company, uh, CG Analytics, which did uh, game integrity, fraud prevention, odds creation. So all those hundreds of Super Bowl props we would make odds on. We'd make all the odds for the futures. And 
Um, you know, it was a wonderful experience understanding how much goes into a regulated sports book. You know, uh, there's just so much between audit and compliance and, and everything that goes into running a sports book. And the fact that they operate on basically a 4% margins uh, is amazing. So you really understand the importance of successful promotions. You can't strike out on your promotions. Uh, making sure that, you know, you're always running things appropriately, odds are on track, you have the best tracking of injuries and information. And in late 2017, with a little bit of uh, insight from some of the leagues I was working with on the CG analytics side, we knew that PASPA was going to be repealed in Q2 or Q3 of 2018. So I went and uh, got some private funding up and started uh, U.S. Integrity, you know, our largest investor is 76 Capital out of Philadelphia, and we understood the need for conflict-free technology and data-driven game integrity, fraud prevention, uh, you know, player and ref safety, insider information tracking. We just do such a large abundance of stuff, and, uh, you know, we couldn't be any more excited. We're the only conflict-free integrity provider, I believe, in the United States, and you know, we work with operators, the people actually running the sports books, regulators, people making all of the rules, and uh, and all of the leagues. We work with the Pac-12, the Big 12, the SEC, West Coast Conference, Big Sky, Big West, uh, Penn State University, Pittsburgh University, uh, the NBA, Las Vegas Lights FC. All right. You know, we work with all right. Go ahead. All right, well, let, let me get the, the um, program rolling. But one thing I want to have you backtrack on because not everybody's going to understand the uh, PASPA and the, the whole legalization of, of sports cameras. So I got a question with that. When you got into this business, did you have the foresight to say, hey, if I get really good at this down the road, it's, it's just a matter of time before – uh, sports gambling will be legalized in other states around the country. Hey, absolutely. And I think one of the spearheads to that was what we started to see a couple of years after I got into sports betting was the legalization of marijuana in several, uh, several of these states. And if you're going to legalize marijuana for revenue purposes in the state, then sports betting was already kind of the next great, you know, great divide out there, the great Moby Dick. I mean, so I, I think at the time when I started um, at Cantor Gaming, there were 38 states that had some type of casinos, casino okay. or casino style wagering in the country. So the next evolution, I think, was always going to be sports betting. When you and I were in Las Vegas um, taping content for our course, I said, Matt, I, I, I'm really fascinated by your whole – and in the industry, but some people, uh, some cynics might say, you're putting sports gambling and integrity in the same sentence. And one of the things that you said to me that I has stuck with me is like, Jim, think of it this way. If you go out to Vegas to play blackjack, you want to make sure that the cards aren't stacked against you. And my response was, you're damn right. And, and, and you said, hey, uh, why would sports be any different? And, and that, to me, that's kind of been my simple reaction when somebody, you know, takes issue with with integrity in sports gambling. But, you know, uh, before you know it, this is going to be like a five hundred billion dollar industry, right? Quickly. I mean, the expectation was in twenty twenty that there would be somewhere between one hundred fifty and two hundred billion dollars wagered amongst approximately twenty five states. Now, Corona has sort of slowed that down. We missed the huge March Madness buzz, which normally does about uh, three and a half to four times the handle of the Super Bowl when you encompass all the games of March Madness. So a lot of revenue lost there. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a rapidly growing industry. And to your point, look, I mean, at the end of the day, using the blackjack analogy, you know, the casinos have to make sure that the dealers are on the up and up, the cards they're using are appropriate so that the players are getting a fair shake and that the players aren't robbing the casinos. But in sports betting, it's just so much more. It's, it's insider information tracking, it's players, it's coaches, it's referees, there's so many vulnerability points and the credibility of the games at risk that, uh, you know, it's a big job. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things that we discussed in uh, Athens when you were on campus, 
uh, I, I've got kind of a basketball background after working for the Cavs for close to 11 seasons, 11 years, and then a son that went on to become a college basketball coach. I, I asked you the question uh, on campus. I said, of all the sports, which one um, is probably most suspect to outside influence? And you, it, you didn't even blink and you said college basketball. So could, could you share a little bit of that uh, answer with our audience? Yeah, unfortunately, it's not even close. And uh, college basketball has by far the most amount of scandals. Just look at recent history, you know, going back 25 years, you know, you have Arizona State, Northwestern, uh, most recently San Diego University, where just 2014, their all-time leading assist and scorer, Brandon Johnson gets busted for uh, match fixing. And, and, and it ended up being that Brandon Johnson was making uh, less than $3,000 a match to fix games at the University of San Diego. And this was a young man who is going to play professional basketball somewhere. And one of the reasons it's, it's so prevalent in college basketball is A, the betting limits are pretty large. They're not quite as large as college football betting limits but they're almost <laughs> identical to NBA betting limits. You could bet a lot of money on any D1 versus D1 college basketball game. And second of all is college basketball is one of the few sports where one player can make all the difference in the world. Basically, if you get the starting point guard for a team, you could fix a basketball game. All right, so let, let's stay with the example that you cited with the young man from the University of San Diego. So they're paying him off. They're giving him $3,000 to you know, have an impact or influence the, the outcome on the game. But how much money might have gone down on one of those games from, you know, to, I, I think in your industry, it's, it's a total handle, right? So how, how much money would be bet on a, a game where the kid's getting $3,000? Uh, in the example, in that example, the Brandon Johnson example, with bets that they were able to, to track and prove, and it's not an example, exact number so nobody can be sure right um they estimated that it was between three hundred thousand and five hundred thousand a game by the betters involved so what what uh, you know you talk about abusing a student athlete but you know three thousand dollars to a kid on a college basketball team could could seem like a fortune sure and a lot of times what happens with these kids too is it's not someone it's not someone that just walks up to you and says, hey, you want to make a quick three grand? It's a superstar athlete who, for whatever reason, has left himself vulnerable. They got themselves in debt by gambling. They, you know, they had some issues, you know, maybe health-wise, family-related, where they have to help a family member out. Either way, they got themselves jammed up somehow. And at the time, maybe it's just a few thousand dollars they need. You know, $3,000 to people our age, Jim, who are in the professional setting doesn't seem like a lot of money. But if we all think back to when we were in college, we could picture a situation where a young man or woman gets jammed up and, you know, three, four, five, six, you know, somewhere less than $10,000 bails them out of all these jams. And, and at that age, look at it, 20 years old, $3,000 might as well be 300000 because where do you get it? Uh, at least that's how some of these young men and women feel. And next thing you know, um, you're fixing games. And then after that, and, and what happened in the case of Brandon Johnson, and we've seen it many times, is it started off at 3000 a game. And down the road, they just extorted them into it. Right. Hey, real quick, uh, you're working with some pretty high – profile clients, uh, many of which we're connected to. But when we were looking at teaming up with you, your, your resume is pretty impressive. So I, I just put uh, a couple of logos that I grabbed from your website up there. But can you talk to us about some of the work that you might be doing? Oh, let, let's start with the NBA and then how it rolls into uh, maybe similar um, functions and, and uh, benefits for the, the college conferences that you're working with. Well, the professional leagues, especially the NBA and the NFL, are in a much different scenario and focus or vulnerability level than the collegiate leagues in this standpoint. There's more individual bets available in the NBA or the NFL than there are in college sports. For instance, every single time the Houston Rockets play, there's bets available. How many points will James Harden get? You know, uh, how many points and assists will Russell Westbrook get? And because of that, it, those 
bets, you know, those type of markets don't necessarily influence who wins or loses the game, you know. And what happens in a scenario where James Harden's over under points is 39 and a half. He has 38 early in the fourth quarter. They're up 20. And suddenly he benches himself or the coach says, all right, come on, you know, let's, that's good for the night. We're up 20. You know, there's some worry there that that could be manipulated by coaches and players who are, who understand that there's a, a big marketplace availability to make these types of wagers where at the collegiate levels, especially in basketball, we don't see as many player props on regular season games. It's mostly just, you know, point spreads on the games, the over-unders on the games. So we don't see that individual basis. The bigger vulnerabilities in college is the collegiate players fixing matches and the referees. You know, at the end of the day, referees are one of the biggest vulnerabilities in every sport. We really closely track the referees in all these sports to develop a career behavioral pattern so we could say, hey, this ref you know, calls a lot of fouls every game, or this ref tends to be affected more by the home court so that we can develop a norm for that official so that when they do something that's abnormal to them and the wagering correlates, we can go back and kind of deep dive into what may have happened. But a lot more uh, focus on the individual players at the professional level because there's so many more bets available on them and a lot more team focus at the collegiate level. All right, so let, let's say you can our our audience a little bit on monitoring. You have a unique relationship with um, the casinos and the sports books out in Vegas. I'm not sure they're going to let anybody else into the family the way that you would, but you, you've got access to a lot of data and can kind of look for what I like to refer to as potential blips in what's going on. Like, hey, what's going on over here, right? Yeah, because of the fact that we don't, create odds, manage odds, manage risk, operate sports books. We don't do any of those things. And because of that, um, and our relationships with the regulators in each state, sports book operators feel comfortable providing us uh, what we call real betting data, which is every single bet that they take on an anonymized basis. We don't get the player names or account numbers, but we're able to access the bets that they take. And at the end of the day, lines move for so many reasons. Line movement analysis is really important, but being able to get that betting data and actually show that, okay, um, you know, there may have been some information leaking here that this player wasn't going to play. And then here's when the bets were actually made. Here's when the line started moving heavily. You know, we can really track what we think might be going on. And then we can use those bets to go back to the regulators and say, hey, you know, this referee called 38 fouls on one team, three on the other team. We had a lot of wagering on that same team. Can you tell me who placed bets A through uh, Z here? And then, and then we go back and see if it was the same person. And if it was, we can run that individual's name through LexisNexis or some other platform and see, you know, was it the brother-in-law of the referee or the, the cousin of the quarterback? Or are they from the same small town and, you know, name the state and, then that gives us the availability to go back to the regulators or the FBI or whoever's involved and, and start the process of potentially, you know, doing a deeper investigation and sending out subpoenas and et cetera. Okay. So let's, let's, let's shift gears just for a second here and current status of sports and its impact on sports gambling from a marketing standpoint, that's my background. I think legalized sports gambling might be the best thing that ever happened to make the game more interactive with fans. Yeah, absolutely. Look, the, the, the more states that legalize, the better it is, and it opens their chance for engagement. There's so many studies out there that have proven the fact that if you make a bet on the game, you're, you're eight times more likely to watch that game than if you didn't make a bet on that game. So, if the leagues and the states can use it as an engagement tool, just think, okay, a person bets $50 on Ohio University tonight. Suddenly, they're eight times more likely to watch that Ohio University game. Now we're watching that Ohio University game, and boy, we have an enjoyable experience. They won. It was, it was fun. We had a lot of fun watching it. Now maybe they want to go to Ohio University a game, attend a game live, or buy merchandise, and you know, there's a lot of different ways professional and collegiate teams can use sports betting as an engagement tool 
you know, we see these big casino um, sponsorship and, and corporate partnership deals with these big stadiums and, and universities and professional and collegiate teams. And all of that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, if you're going to do those big corporate partnerships and you're going to have the, you know, you're going to have that intersection of sports gambling and regular sports, then you need to make sure that you have game integrity and consumer protections in place. And that's where U.S. integrity comes in. Cool. All right. So let's, um, let's drill a little deeper so we can educate our audience before some of them take our course on sports integrity monitoring. And I, on this one, I went to your website and I like the way you guys have kind of broken it down into uh, four pillars, if you will. So um, if you don't mind spending a couple of minutes just walking our, uh, our Bobcat audience through your four, four pillars and what, what you're able to do. Sure, and, and we talked briefly about the line movement and embedding data analysis already and how important it is to be able to get real data coming from the casinos on both a live and archive basis if you're going to investigate or monitor for abnormalities. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to find is correlated wagering abnormalities that correlate with abnormalities within the event, whether it's player, coaches, or something else. And that kind of triggers a red flag for us to investigate. Misuse of insider information is the most prevalent sort of pillar that we catch people on consistently in both professional and collegiate sports. And what's starting to happen is some of these state regulations in terms of misuse of insider information are starting to mirror what we see in the financial services world. I mean, if you remember, they sent Martha Stewart to prison for misuse of insider information, basically. And, and it's no different in the sports betting world. If you're a sports administrator who knows that you're going to suspend your star point guard, and yet suddenly this massive wave of betting action comes in against that team right before you actually go ahead and, and announce that suspension, then we're going to wonder why and well, you know what's going on. And, and this happens a lot coming from you know equipment managers, trainers, other players on the team. There's always been a sort of marketplace for this information. And the more difficult it is to get that information about your team, the greater that marketplace grows. You know, we always tell all of our partners, their coaches, that if you continue to be non-transparent and in the worst case scenario, misleading about the injury and eligibility issues of your players, you're going to put your equipment managers, your trainers, your associate coaches, all at a much greater risk. Because if the betters know the sports books can never get this information because the coach never shares it, then suddenly there's an underground market to go and get it because the information has so much value. Um, so you know, transparency is important, but we see in misuse of insider information cases all the time. Notable player or coaching events that tends to go to game manipulation, point shaving, match fixing. Uh, again, if we look at all the, the recent examples in the last 20, 25 years, Arizona State, Northwestern, Toledo, UTEP, Hawaii, Tim Donahue, in each and every one of these cases, the perpetrator was getting about $3,000 or less. It's not big multi-million dollar scandals to get players um, to try to, you know, uh, you know, fix matches or shave points. It's usually significantly less money than anyone would ever believe. And then referee monitoring, we've talked about, referees are the mo highest vulnerability in every single sport, both professional and collegiate. The home plate umpire in baseball, uh, you know, the crew chief in football, the, the referees in basketball, they can really dictate. I mean, think of how many, uh, I can't even begin to explain how many complaints we get about NFL refs. You know, remember the Saints NFC championship game oh, yeah. a couple of oh, years yeah. ago? Uh, every single time that happens, we get accusations of referees fixing games. And I would say it's about three to one, about 75% of the time we spend all this time advocating as to why the referee didn't fix the match that all the conspiracy theorists think he did. And about 25% of the time saying, hey, we think there might be an issue with this re referee here. And, you know, nobody wants to see the next big referee scandal. So we pay very, very close attention to it. But the understanding that they have such a, you know, that's such a high vulnerability for each of the 
individual uh, stakeholders. Right. Now, one of the other things that you spend a lot of your time on is working with different regulators in different states, but um, one size doesn't fit all. What, what you can do in New Jersey, you might not be able to do in New York. So walk, walk us through some of the challenges and some of the work that you've done in this space. Yeah, and it's not just one size doesn't fit all with the regulators. It's one size doesn't fit all with the teams and the universities as well. And regulations is tremendously vary from state to state. Think of the state of Colorado, which has a mandate that, you know, all the operators have to provide their, have to contract an approved independent integrity operator and provide that approved integrity operator all of their bet level data where some states have a much more lax uh, integrity provision. So at, at the end of the in, you know at the end of the day, we need to make sure that that these universities and operators are able to meet the mandates of these states. I think a good example too is about half the states have um, you know some type of mandate for exclusion lists that the universities and professional teams provide these operators a list of people who shouldn't be able to wager on those games and that's players coaches and people of interest whether it's trainers or other people with pertinent locker room information um you know and it's hard those things especially in college sports they're so fluid uh the coaches change jobs so often players are graduating and moving around schools that it's hard to keep track of these lists so you know it's very customized services some of these schools don't even track their own officials very well or some of these conferences and we have to do more officiating tracking for them so at the end of the day we want to make sure everybody's in a good position from an integrity standpoint and the services that they really need whether it's education awareness policies and procedures officiating monitoring player and referee safety we want to make sure that, that we're providing all the services that they need the most okay uh let's talk about our partnership in our course and as I'm listening to you run through a lot of our uh, content today, if I'm a college athletic director and I'm in a state that's getting ready to legalize sports gambling, I, I better be ready. <laughs> and, and that's where we saw the opportunity. Now, it's, it's not going to just be folks in college athletics, but uh, to me, I don't think this is a luxury item. I think it's a, a necessity. And we're so excited to be working with you and Cyana on this partnership. Uh, Cyana will be doing all the, the behind the scenes production, but um, this is something that uh, we, we better get going and, and start educating our, our administrators up because if I could just see the news camera someday saying, well, how much, how much training or education did you and your staff do on sports gambling before before this event occurred or this thing happened. Cause that's, that's where, and in, in, in my mind, this is going to get big, 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 big as a business, but uh, we can't lose the trust of the fans and we got to show that we're, you know, we, we've got a plan in place. So uh, your, your thoughts about the course and really, I mean, th this is one where uh, most of the intellectual property is coming from your office, your background. And we're, we're going to do a little bit of color commentary on broadcasting and marketing and all that, but um, well, I don't know. It, this may come across as self-promotion, but I, I really don't think this is a luxury. I think it's going to become a necessity. I absolutely agree. I thought Bob Bull and the chief integrity officer from Penn State put it best to me, better than I've ever heard anyone else explain it. He said, look, for the administrators across the country, there needs to be something in place because at the end of the day, it's uh, so sports betting got dumped on your desk. What do you do now? I mean, basically throughout your entire career previous to 2018, you were told to stay as far away from sports betting as possible. Now, suddenly, if you're someone like the University of Pittsburgh, right across from their football stadium is Rivers Casinos where people are betting on their games and suddenly, you know, is it an engagement tool and what are the new threats that it poses? And, you know, one of the bigger threats is player health, player ref and safety. You know, we saw that the incident in Baylor where Macy Oteague, you know, Baylor's up eight on the road. He misses a couple of free throws with eight seconds left. He goes to school the next day thinking he's the hero 
but instead he's getting scrutinized, he's getting death threats, because if he makes one of those free throws, they cover the point spread. And so all the people that actually bet on Baylor lost their money, but Macy Oteague didn't even know what the point spread is, and suddenly there's a whole new realm of player safety, mental wellness involved, how do we handle it? What, what types of new rules, policies, procedures, audits do we need to have in place? How do we protect the student athletes? Heck, who on campus, if anybody, should be able to gamble? Um, there's just so many questions that come along with regulated sports betting, and regulated sports betting isn't going away. We want to be here to help walk everybody through some of those challenges, answer some of those questions, and take away a little bit of that intimidation, that fear, that comes along with looking at, oh my gosh, what do I do now? How do I handle this? And we think this course does that. Yeah, and I, as we uh, made our first announcement a week ago, I, I was contacted by a good friend that is head of sponsorship sales with a major league baseball team. And he said, hey, I want to take the course. And I, I wasn't thinking of that, you know, as, as a natural area. But, but what he said was that, listen, I'm going to be negotiating a big, big deal in this or number of big deals in this category once sports gambling gets legalized in our state. But the organization, because I'm in that position, they want me to become the team's business expert on sports gambling. And he said, I, I need a class like this. And I'm like, yeah, yes, you do. <laughs> so, all right. Ed, uh, real quick, what if, if you had, uh, I don't know, 30 second soundbite to tell uh, prospective students what they might expect in the course from your end. What, what would you say? I, I think it's a great opening course in terms of what is regulated sports betting, especially in comparison to, um, you know, what sports betting was when it was underground. Okay, so now sports betting is legal. What does that mean? What does it present in terms of opportunities, opportunities for engagement, corporate partners, sponsorships, getting your team more visibility. We're seeing way more visibility in betting on men's collegiate baseball, women's collegiate softball, men's and women's lacrosse. There's a real opportunity here for the really acute, savvy sports administrator to get more engagement out of this, but also there's a lot of pitfalls along the way and potential you know, uh, landmines that you could step on. We're, help, we're here to help you avoid those landmines, avoid those pitfalls, and use sports betting as the engagement tool that it can be. Right, and we, uh, we're bringing our own Matt Cacciato into play because one of the things that we know for sure is that legalized sports gambling will amplify TV ratings. And at the end yes. of the day, that's, that there's a lot of money coming on the TV set. All right, so we've got time for maybe some closing questions that I'll throw your way, but let, let's have a little bit of fun so our Bobcat family can get to know you a little bit, but if, and, and you can just give me quick answers on these, but your favorite sport growing up as a kid? Ooh, um, I would either say baseball or college basketball. Most memorable sporting event you've ever been to? Uh, Red Sox Dodgers World Series. Most amount of money you ever saw someone put down uh, when you were working on the gaming side and the casino side for, for, a, for a legalized sports bet in Vegas? Uh, Mattress Mac, the first time when he had that big promotion going, I think he got down $7 million. I think $7 million is still the biggest bet I've seen. Okay. And looking into your crystal ball, we're at 2020, at the 2030 Symposium, what will we be talking about then when it, as it relates to sports gambling? The ability to watch games using your uh, Apple Play you know, your Apple TV account, gamble on those same games you're watching through your TV on your Apple Play account. It's going to be one synonymous mechanism in 10 years. Whatever mechanism you're using on your TV, you'll also be able to use that for your payment processing to wager on the games right there from the comfort of your home. Cool. Well, hey, Matt, we appreciate you taking time out of a busy schedule and are really looking forward to launching this course and, and uh, developing a long-term partnership with you and your, uh, the rest of your staff at U.S. Integrity and 
before you know it, uh, you'll either be back on campus lecturing or we'll come out to Vegas and pay another visit. And both of those sound great to me. Uh, thanks for having me, Jim. I really appreciate it. We're so honored to be working with you and your team. You guys have been great. Thanks again to Matt Holt with U.S. Integrity. We'll be providing you all information on the course um, with our next newsletter and some other things. But the good news for you, uh, being a member of the Bobcat family, um, is a substantial discount. And we're excited to be able to offer that to you. We've looked at the landscape and think that uh, this executive ed course is priced accordingly. But to get another 25% off of that, um, you, you, you'll be ahead of the curve. And hopefully that's just another way that you can, um, you know, extend some value with your relationship with us. That, that you'll get a promotional code on that. So it's not like you can hand it off to the person down the hallway. You, you'll have to be an alumnus of Ohio University. So that's going to wrap up things for this session. Stay safe out there and have a great day.